Chapter 8 The Fight with Three Stars He stayed at the soldier's town this time until the grass was good and the moon when the ponies shed May. Then my father told me we were going back to Crazy Horse and that we were going to have to fight from then on because there was no other way to keep our country. He said that Red Cloud was a cheap man and wanted to sell the Black Hills to the Wazichus. That Spotted Tail and other chiefs were cheap men too. And that the hang around the fort people were all cheap and would stand up for the Wazichus. My aunt, who was living at the soldier's town, must have felt the way we did because when we were breaking camp, she gave me a six shooter like the soldiers had and told me I was a man now. I was 13 years old and not very big for my age, but I thought I should have to be a man anyway. We boys had practiced endurance and we were all good riders and I could shoot straight with either a bow or a gun. We were a small band and we started in the night and traveled fast. Before we got to Warbonnet Creek, some Cheyalas, Cheyennes, joined us because their hearts were bad like ours and they were going to the same place. Later I learned that many small bands were doing the same thing and coming together from everywhere. Just after we camped on the war bonnet, our scouts saw a wagon train of the Wazichus coming up the old road that caused the trouble before. We had oxen hitched to their wagons and they were part of the river of Wazichus that was running into the Black Hills. They shot at our scouts and we decided we would attack them. When the war party was getting ready, I made up my mind that, small as I was, I might as well die there, and if I did, maybe I'd be known. I told Jumping Horse, a boy about my age, that I was going along to die, and he said he would too. So we went, and so did Crab and some other boys. When the Wazichus saw us coming, they put the wagons in a circle and got inside with their oxen. We rode around and around them in a wide circle that kept getting narrower. That's the best way to fight because it's hard to hit ponies running fast in a circle. And sometimes there would be two circles, one inside the other, going fast in opposite directions which made it still harder to hit. The cavalry of the Wazichus did not know how to fight. They kept together and when they came on you could hardly miss them. We kept apart in the circle. While we were riding around the wagons, we were hanging low on the outside of the ponies and shooting under their necks. This was not easy to do, even when your legs were long, and mine were not yet very long. But I stuck tight and shot with the six-shooter my aunt gave me. Before we started the attack, I was afraid, but Big Man told us we were brave boys, and I soon got over being frightened. The Wazichus shot fast at us from behind the wagons, and I could hear bullets whizzing, but they didn't hit any of us. I kept thinking of my vision, and maybe that helped. I do not know whether we killed any Wazichus or not. We rode around several times, and once we got close, but there were not many of us, and we could not get at the Wazichus behind their wagons, so we went away. This was my first fight. When we were going back to camp, some Shaila warriors told us we were very brave boys, and that we were going to have plenty of fighting. We were traveling very fast now for we were in danger and wanted to get back to Crazy Horse. He had moved over west to the Rosebud River and the people were gathered there. As we traveled, we met other little bands all going to the same place until there was a good many of us all mixed up before we got there. Red Cloud's son was with us, but Red Cloud stayed at the soldier's town. When we came to the ridge on this side of the Rosebud River, we could see the valley full of teepees and the ponies could not be counted. Many, many people were there. Oglalas, Hunkpapas, Minakanju, Sanzark, Blackfeet, Brules, Santis, and Yanktanes. Also, many Shaila and Blue Clouds had come to fight with us. The village was long and you could not see all the camps with one look. The scouts came out to meet us and bring us in and everybody rejoiced that we had come. Great men were there, Crazy Horse and Big Road of the Oglalas, Sitting Bull and Gaul, and Black Moon and Crow King of the Hunk Papas. 
spotted eagle of the sun's arc, the younger hump and fast bull of the Miniconjum, dull knife and ice bear of the Shiela, ink paduta with the Santis and the Yanktanais. Great men were there with all those people and horses. Hachetu alo! About the middle of the moon of making fat, June, the whole village moved a little way up the river to a good place for the sun dance. The valley was wide and flat there, and we camped in a great oval with the river flowing through it. And in the center, they built the bower branches in a circle for the dancers, with the opening of it to the east, whence comes the light. Scouts were sent out in all directions to guard the sacred place. Sitting Bull, who was the greatest medicine man of the nation at that time, had charge of this dance, to purify the people and to give them power and endurance. It was held in the moon of fatness because that is the time when the sun is highest and the growing power of the world is strongest. I will tell you how it was done. First, a holy man was sent out all alone to find the wagachon, the rustling tree, the cottonwood. The holy tree that should stand in the middle of the dancing circle. Nobody dared follow to see what he did or hear the sacred words he would say there. And when he had found the right tree, he would tell the people, and they would come there singing with flowers all over them. Then, when they had gathered about the holy tree, some women who were bearing children would dance around it because the spirit of the sun loves all fruitfulness. After that, a warrior who had done some very brave deed that summer struck the tree, counting coup upon it. And when he had done this, he had to give gifts to those who had least of everything, and the braver he was, the more he gave away. After this, a band of young maidens came singing with sharp axes in their hands, and they had to be so good that nobody there could say anything against them, or that any man had ever known them. And it was the duty of anyone who knew anything bad about any of them to tell it right before all the people there and prove it. But if anybody lied, it was very bad for him. The maidens chopped the tree down and trimmed its branches off. Then chiefs, who were the sons of chiefs, carried the sacred tree home, stopping four times on the way, once for each season, giving thanks for each. Now, when the holy tree had been brought home, but was not yet set up in the center of the dancing place, mounted warriors gathered around the circle of the village, and at a signal they all charged inward upon the center where the tree would stand, each trying to be the first to touch the sacred place. And whoever was the first could not be killed in war that year. When they all came together in the middle, it was like a battle, with the ponies rearing and screaming and a big dust, and the men shouting and wrestling and trying to throw each other off the horses. After that, there was a big feast and plenty for everybody to eat, and a big dance, just as though we had won a victory. The next day, the tree was planted in the center by holy men, who sang sacred songs and made sacred vows to the spirit. And the next morning, nursing mothers brought their holy little ones to lay them at the bottom of the tree, so that the sons would be brave men, and the daughters the mothers of brave men. The holy men pierced the ears of the little ones, and for each piercing the parents gave away a pony to someone who was in need. The next day the dancing began, and those who were going to take part were ready, for they had been fasting and purifying themselves in the sweat lodges and praying. First, their bodies were painted by the holy men. Then each would lie down beneath the tree as though he were dead, and the holy men would cut a place in his back or chest so that a strip of rawhide fastened to the top of the tree could be pushed through the flesh and tied. Then the man would get up and dance to the drums, leaning on the rawhide strip as long as he could stand the pain or until the flesh tore loose. We smaller boys had a good time during the two days of dancing, for we were allowed to do almost anything to tease the people, and they had to stand it. We would gather sharp spear grass, and when a man came along without a shirt, we would stick him to see if, if we could make him cry out, for everybody was supposed to endure everything. Also, we made pop guns out of young ash boughs and shot at men and women to see if we could make them jump, and if they did, everybody laughed at them. 
The mothers carried water to their holy little ones in bladder bags, and we made little bows and arrows that we could hide under our robes so that we could steal up to the women and shoot holes in the bags. They were supposed to stand anything and not scold us when the water spurted out. We had a good time there. Right after the sun dance was over, some of our scouts came in from the south, and the crier went around the circle and said, The scouts have returned, and they have reported that soldiers are camping up the river. So, young warriors, take courage and get ready to meet them. While they were all getting ready, I was getting ready too, because Crazy Horse was going to lead the warriors, and I wanted to go with him. But my uncle, who thought a great deal of me, said, Young nephew, you must not go. Look at the helpless ones. Stay home, and maybe there will be plenty of fighting right here. So the war parties went on without me. Maybe my uncle thought I was too little to do much and might get killed. Then the crier told us to break camp, and we moved over west towards the greasy grass and camped at the head of Spring Creek while the war parties were gone. We learned later that it was Three Stars who fought with our people on the Rosebud that time. He had many walking soldiers and some cavalry, and there were many crows and Shoshone with him. They were all coming to attack us when we had the sun dance, but Crazy Horse whipped them, and they went back to Goose Creek, where they had all their wagons. My friend Ironhawk was there that day, and he can tell you how it was. Ironhawk speaks. I am a hunk papa. I was 14 years old that summer. And I was a big boy. Two war parties went out. A very large one from the south end of the camp and a small one from the north end. I went with the small one, and there were only about 40 of us. The big party got there early in the morning, and when we came, they had been fighting a long while. There is a wide valley there at the bend of the river with some bluffs and hills around it, and it looked as though the people were fighting all over that place. There were crows with the soldiers, and we began fighting with some of them. It looked as though we were getting the best of them. Then the soldiers began to advance on the other side of us, and we had to retreat. We were heading where the big party was, but the soldiers were after us, and the crows got braver and fought harder because of the soldiers. When we got to the bend, the crows were right among us, and it was all mixed up fighting there. I don't know whether I killed anybody or not, but I guess I did for I was scared and fought hard. And the way it was, you couldn't keep from killing somebody if you didn't get killed, and I'm still alive. There was a Lakota with me by the name of Without a Teepee, and a big crow pulled him right off his horse, and he disappeared. Of course, me, I ran for my life, because we could not fight all those crows and the soldiers too, and I was scared, but I was not running alone. We were all running, with the crows after us. Then all at once we saw a band of cavalry coming right ahead of us, about 30 of them. I don't know how they got there. Maybe they were returning from a scouting trip. It looked bad for us. Then I heard voices crying in our language, Take courage! This is a good day to die! Think of the children and the helpless at home. So we all yelled, Hokahay! And charged on the cavalrymen and began shooting them off their horses, for they turned and ran. They were running toward their big party, and I could see many people were fighting over there, but everything was all mixed up, and you could not tell what was happening. It was a pitiful, long-stretched-out battle. They fought all day. Then the crows were on us from behind, and we turned around and charged back on them. But many soldiers were behind them coming, so we all had to run, crying, Yahee! because there were not enough of us. By now, I was very scared, and I ran for my life. I came to a rocky place, and my pony stepped between two stones and nearly tore his hoof off. There was a very brave Shiela by the name of Sitting Eagle. He was a friend of mine, and he had been with me in the fight. When I got off my pony to look at his hoof, a single crow was coming after me. Then I saw my friend, the Shiela, going to meet the crow. They fought hand to hand, and the crow went down. I wish I had stayed with Sitting Eagle because then I could have been the first to coo that crow, but another man did it. I ran on foot, leading my horse, who was hopping on three legs. Then I saw smoke coming out of a deep gully where there was a creek. I went over to the smoke, and there were three Lakotas who had killed a bison and were having a feast 
right there while all the fighting was going on over the hill. They invited me, so I sat there and ate, for I was about 14 years old and I was always hungry. We had to watch out while we ate. One of the men took some clotted blood from the bison and put it in some raw bison hide and fastened it around my pony's hoof so that I could ride. After we had been eating there a long time, a Lakota came up on his horse with blood and dirt all over his face, and he was angry. He said, What are you doing here? We're fighting. All you think of is to eat. Why don't you think about the helpless ones at home? Come, make haste. We've got to stand our ground. I felt ashamed, so I got on my horse and we started. My horse could go better with his hoof tied up that way. We came to a ridge, and I could see all over the valley of the Rosebud where the fighting was going on. You could not tell who was getting whipped. It looked all mixed up. Some crows attacked us there, and I never got to the big party that was doing the hard fighting, but it was bad enough where I was, except when I was eating. I must have eaten a great deal, for it was evening now. Of course, when we got there, they had been fighting a good while already. We all came away when it was dark to guard the women and children, and the enemy did not follow us. Of course, I thought the Wazichus had whipped us, but I learned it was not so. It was not a finished battle because the night stopped it, but the Wazichus got whipped anyway and did not attack our village. They went back to their wagons on Goose Creek and stayed there. Standing Bear speaks. I was not in that fight. There were many who were not. The warriors came back in the dark, and everybody was so excited that nobody slept all night. The next morning, about twenty of us young fellows started out to see where the fight had been. First we saw a dead horse without shoes. Then we saw a dead horse with shoes. And near this one was a soldier full of arrows. We got to where the soldiers had camped after that fight, and there was a place where the ground was fresh and a big fire had been built on it. We started to dig there to see what was hidden. We got down on our hands and knees and dug up the loose ground. After a while we came to a blanket and there was a dead soldier in it and it was tied around his legs and waist and neck. We pulled him out and one of the men said, This is my blanket. I've been looking for this blanket. I will have this blanket. So he took it. Under that was another dead soldier tied up in a blanket, and then another, and another under that. The fourth one was a black Wazichu. Each time somebody said, this is my blanket, and took it. I got the fifth one, and the man inside was young, and he had a ring on his finger with a white stone in it that sparkled. I cut off the finger, and I had the ring for a long time. One of our men scalped the soldier and started home with the scalp on a stick. When we got on top of the ridge, we could see the soldiers of Three Stars retreating toward Goose Creek a long way off. A big dust was rising there. Then we went home. The village stayed at the head of Spring Creek several days. Then we all broke camp and moved over to the greasy grass.